methodically adjusting his pieces. And you called this kind of mind games from Magnus Carlsen, making his opponent revel in the pressure of waiting for his first move. Will we see E5, the most principled response? Will we see a symmetrical English? Or will Magnus Carlsen stick to a Queen's Gambit decline scheme with E6? I'm expecting the first move to be Knight F6. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, simply the most flexible move. You still do not show your cards. You might be able to, after Knight C to switch to E5 if you want. Yes, uh, but it's all about mind games. And Magnus knows very well that he can play any kind of opening. And he also knows that his opponent is going crazy right now. That, okay, <laughs> come on, show me what you're going to play. Because you know exactly that before in the preparation, you have to kind of consider <laughs> like 15, 20 different choices of, of Magnus. Man, this reminds me of that time in school where, where the teacher is about to pass out the tests and something keeps distracting my teacher. It talks about what grades people received and then what the weather is like. Just pass out the test already so I know what I got. And Prague taking a sip of water there. Magnus taking a prolonged period of time, two minutes now. And the question that we always ask, you know, is he actually deciding what to play? I don't think there's any chance of that being the case. Prague has already played C4 this tournament, and there it is, E5. For And there we have it, the bailout, a 35-move draw in our championship game. What 
a well-played game. Prognananda with some filigree precision in the end game as they discuss the position. Uh, really impressive, Peter. I think that just the precision with which Prognananda handled that final part of the game it started to feel like Magnus might be putting some pressure, but at the end of the day, a very balanced, well-played affair lasting just about three hours. <laughs> and true to his form, he arrives holding two bottles of water with exactly four seconds remaining before the start of the round as Prague carefully adjusts his pieces. The first couple of moves are going to be particularly important. A warm handshake uh, by the ceremonial guest there. And we are about to see the ceremonial first move, which is, I think, E2, E4. But that does not mean Magnus will necessarily play E4. The move will be retracted. And then Magnus will make the official first move of the game. And it appears to, in fact, be the move E2, E4. Yes, it was somehow guessable. Uh, I, I think that also you remember that match against Vincent Keimer in the decisive final game that Magnus won. He went for 1E4. Yeah, He wanted to play the Rui Lopez. And Prague taking his time doing the Magnus thing, not answering immediately. Is he thinking about, should I play E5 or should I play C5? It's clear that he has already made up his mind before the game. Uh, but it's also nice to see Magnus' own medicine uh, uh, being employed against himself. And as we start this game, uh, before Prague makes his first move, a big shout out. We have already over 50,000 people watching from every corner of the world, which includes so many of Prague's fans from his hometown state of Tamil Nadu in India, but also across the world. And of course, Magnus Carlsen uh, with so many fans that he has generated for decades. This is going to be awesome. Seatbelts fastened and Prague's response, the King's Pawn game, E4, E5. Yeah, E4, E5 on the board, a very professional response. Uh, also was uh, kind of uh, easy to guess in a very important game. You want to be as solid as possible and wait for your opponent to show his cards. I do believe that uh, Magnus will go for the Rui Lopez. I don't believe that he's going to play the Italian since Pragnanda has been really involved in a lot of uh, discussions there with uh, Fabiano. And no, four knights. All right, that's a surprise. Whoa. Okay, and now...
I think we're moments away. We're moments away from a handshake. And that means moments away from our job continuing tomorrow. And I'm secretly happy, Peter. I don't think anybody watching will begrudge me uh, the point that I really did want deep inside. I wanted a rapid tiebreaker because what a fitting end this would be uh, to, to this epic, epic event. As we see H3, H5, Magnus might play G4 here. He might move his king up, but that's it. I mean, these moves are purely symbolic at this point. Yeah, King E2 played, H3, H5 played before. Black puts everything on the light squares, of course. There we uh, go. White has the dark squared bishop. Handshake, draw agreed. Wow. Well, that kind of game arc, I don't think anybody quite expected. They do make it to 30 moves, but the result of the game was essentially determined by Magnus Carlsen's opening choice. He plays a bailout line, uh, the four knights, with this e5 variation leading immediately to a very balanced endgame and a great job by Prague maintaining his composure, playing very accurately, not giving Magnus any unnecessary chances to extend the game. And indeed, he is on time. Carlsen will have black, sits down with his customary two bottles of water, and Prague, as he has done so many times, starting by carefully adjusting every one of his pieces with the white pieces in game one. Prague will have to put some pressure on Magnus Carlsen and set a strong tone. Yeah, setting a tone is very important. Uh, then automatically your opponent will also feel that I have to do something with my white pieces as well. The handshake is there. Let's go. And... Or not. There we go. E4. And now it is Magnus's turn to shadow his pieces. And that was three bottles of water. My counting skills not up to par this early in the morning. And Carlson responds, much like yesterday's game with colors reversed with E5. And something tells me that Prague will not be essaying the four knights defense in this game. It will be the Italian. I'm pretty sure that Prague was for the Italian. Exactly. Bishop C4 on the board. Knight F6. And... Of course, the fried liver with knight g5 has fallen out of fashion. Prague going.
yeah He's under hesitating. some pressure yeah it's it's never easy to start defending something he lit it down on the clock He's got to move, and he does get 10 seconds added to his clock per move, but the situation starting to deteriorate just a little bit. Knight h5, uh-oh, and the knight getting to f4. This is getting scary for Prague. The king g2 move was very unfortunate. Now he has to sidestep from, from the fork. King g1 played. Knight f4, Magnus sensing the moment, and the other knight can jump into g5, creating fork threats, maybe even some mate threats. In some situations. Uh oh. Just in a couple of and Prague down to eight seconds. And look at the speed with which Carlson is moving. Every piece becoming more and more active. The rook coming into h3. It can drive into c3. And suddenly there are all these forks that Prague has to keep in mind. He's got six seconds and a6, a very panicky reaction as he gives up a pawn. Yeah, it is. It is a panicky reaction because because knight is knight a five can be met by rook c three. Also, bishop a four can be met by rook c c knight g five. All this combination of forces seem too much to be to handle. Knight g five might be crushing because if white takes on e five, black's king just moves up to e six, forces the knight out of e five, and then knight f three will fork the rook and the king. And Magnus doesn't see it. He plays rook c three, but knight g five now is even stronger. And he plays it. And this is almost over. This is over, yes. Because knight takes c6 can be met by rook takes c6, bishop c6, knight f3, fork. Prague in a lot of trouble. Knight f3, the knights are running amok. White's counterplay on the queen side has not amounted to anything. And Carlsen has left himself with three whole minutes on the clock to figure out the last couple of touches here. Black is completely winning here. But Prague will continue to fight until the last drop of blood. He tries to get the rooks off the board, but Carlson can play rook a3, and there's got to be some sort of a checkmating mechanism here. Knight h3 and rook a3 wins the game. It wins a piece. Exactly. And Magnus pauses because he knows exactly that, yes, this is it. Let me just be precise. And I, yes, on the board, knight g5 to h3 check. No matter where white is going, king f1 or king h1 will have the same problem that rook a3 will follow with a double attack on the bishop and rook a1 checkmate. The knights, just monster knights. And it took Carlson so much time and so much finesse to get those knights to where they are. It took a lot of turnarounds and the initiative changed hands. But Carlson laughs last and he will laugh, laugh longest in this first game. He will just move his king to f6, getting away from the checks, and the threat of rook a1 checkmate, and rook takes a4, forces Pragnananda to resign the first game, and you can see there a dejected Prag will not have a lot of time to marinate on this game, because he has a task in front of him, and that is to win the next game with the black pieces, Peter. Yeah, it's a mammoth task. Uh, we have to give credit for Magnus sensationally sensing the moment, and that king march with king f8, king e7, prepared his uh, activation of his rook. And once the rook activated itself, then the knights were jumping. What a big victory for Magnus Carlsen. Dry or too drawish. Let's see what Prague can offer us. E4 by Carlsen. That's a kind of slight surprise for me. C5 obviously played. And C3, Magnus sticks to the Alapin, the strategy that Eric Garcia used against Pragnanda, which backfired. On the other hand, now already, Magnus anticipates he knows which setup Prague is intending in a must-win situation. And, and Magnus
Canada. And this is finally the coveted World Cup title for Carlson. It's taken him a long time, but it seems like he is only moments away from claiming the final feather in his cap. Yeah, I, I think we have to mention for the, the viewers who are not that familiar with uh, positions that we would never dare to speculate about this kind of things if there would be real tension in the position. Black's yes. problem is, however, that he's forced with the, the decision that he has to depart from his rook on e3. He can't play the move rook e8. Yes, and there is a handshake, rook takes e1, followed by a draw for nothing, nothing left to do. And the players amicably discussing uh, this game. Perhaps a quick discussion of the opening theory. A great choice by Magnus Carlsen to play the Alapin so heads up. He knew the theory. And uh, after uh, he played knight takes d4 and brought his queen out to f3, it started becoming clear uh, that Prague's winning chances were just non-existent. And in typical professional clean style, Magnus Carlsen secures victory at the 2023 World Cup. As we just said, the final feather in his cap, which had been eluding him for the better part of a decade as he crushes the field. He wins so many iconic matches. He survives an incredible scare against Vincent Keimer. He wins a game on demand and now defeats Pragdananda in a scintillating rapid tiebreak to claim the World Cup title. Insights on an incredible run. Magnus, this is the final feather in your cap. We congratulate you warmly on an amazing final match against Prague. First things first, there's already a lot of buzz over the tweet that you put out shortly after winning. That tweet contains a GIF. Uh, we're gonna play that tweet here really quickly for the chat. Let me start by asking, can you elucidate uh, the deeper meaning uh, behind that tweet and that GIF? Uh, yeah, I told my uh, social media guy like, I don't want to jinx this too hard. Uh, I told him yesterday, like, I don't want to jinx it too hard, but I've been thinking that this is what I po want to post if I um, if I win. So I think uh, it's kind of self-explanatory in, uh, in a way. Um, yeah. Let me ask a slightly more philosophical question, uh, Magnus. This is, of course, the final feather in your cap. You've now won every significant chess tournament at least once, including the World Championship, of course, and now the World Cup. Does this victory in any way change your relationship to classical chess? And does it change your motivations and desires uh, as you continue your chess career and your, your, your focus? That's a very good uh, question. Maybe it changes something a little bit with uh, regards to the, to the World Cup specifically. I wouldn't say it increases the chances that I'm going to play this event again. That's for uh, that's for sure. Um, apart from that, I think uh, that it already, like at least for a bit, maybe for a year or so, I've felt that I'm only really playing classical chess on sort of special occasions um either because it's at home like in norway chess or it's a uh it's a massive tradition like tata or it's either for um you know for family or um for uh, social reasons that i i um that I, that i play and yeah i think in terms of the world cup Winning the World Cup wasn't really a thing for me before 2017. Um, and after I did so poorly, I, s I was thinking that I cannot be let this be my legacy for from the World Cup. And so I felt that I corrected quite a bit of that in 2021 uh, when I had a very good event uh, I was third, winning six out of seven matches, and um, I won a lot of um, classical games there uh, as well. And uh, I didn't have any particular plans of playing this year. Um, to be honest, I, I mean, I did have other plans during the 
during the event that sort of that fell uh, that fell through um and uh so i only really registered at the last moment after no chess when the other plans had fallen through and then it was maybe a bit of an emotional decision after Norwich has thinking that eh, I played so poorly now in classical I don't want to yeah I don't want to like I don't want to you know be let that be the impression of me in classical so let's play something else um try and you know uh gave a better account of of myself um and to be honest i was regretting the choice <laughs> a little bit along the way because i i was thinking like coming up to the tournament that I, I i didn't particularly um they didn't particularly want to play and i even expressed it during the event that i wasn't really sure what's what i'm what i'm doing here but yeah, of course. At the, as the tournament went along, it was clear that you know the only goal goal here was um, to win. Like I could have a good event again, but really, the only thing that would, to any extent, satisfy me is winning the event. And I don't think that's necessarily a good attitude to have. But that's what I am. Um, that's what I felt. And yeah, now that I've done it, I can relax a bit. Yeah, Magnus, uh, let me also enter the stage. Uh, first of all, a very big congratulation. I understand what it means to you winning the World Cup, the only missing title. And my very first question is that giving up the classical title last year, did this edit the pressure that now that you play the World Cup, you have to win it at all cost? I think to some extent, uh, it does add a bit of a uh, bit of pressure but i felt like what was adding more pressure is that i've done so poorly in classical recently um like if even if i was not world champion if it was very clear from my results in classical chess that i'm still comfortably the best player in the world then, yeah, to be honest, I, I wouldn't have played there. So, yeah, that's, um, that did, I, th I think it was more my poor results in classical this year that, um, that, uh, that gave me some pressure and led me to play here more than the world championship title or lack thereof. And my follow, and my follow up question would have been that you have faced tons of, brilliant youngsters what is your take on vincent keimer uh gukesh and pragnananda it it was sensational what we have witnessed during the world cup yeah it's uh it's a little bit funny that i i i faced almost zero like players in their prime i played Turkey and then i played three three youngsters <laughs> so um obviously they are very very strong i think i was lucky that i feel like i had my by far my best day and game of the event against uh, gukesh on the first day uh i think otherwise that match would have been extremely tough as for the others you know they're very very strong um vincent pushed me the um, the hardest he was one move away from um from eliminating me and leaving everything else else moot so i think they're all very very good uh gukesh is clearly the strongest classical player right now um and uh, then you have uh, Prague and Abdus Satorov, who are really strong, but also mentality monsters. Uh, and then um, I think on a tier 
slightly be below below we have um Vincent and and a few others but what I think is very clear is that um chess is in good hands for um for the future um I think this generation of players born from 1990 to 94 um really have dominated for for a long time and finally now with these with these youngsters born uh 2003 and and after we have um sort of a um a generation that's um that's worthy of um successing us when the time comes and the time could be fairly soon magnus let me put one personal curiosity to bed back to your match against vincent where you had that very impressive end game conversion in the second game so two related questions the first i'm assuming that you spotted knight takes e4 the moment that you allowed bishop takes c3. So my first question is, did you in fact see that during the game? And, and sort of what goes through your head as you're waiting for Vincent to make the move? And then related to that, at what point in that game did you start believing that you had a serious chance of coming back? Was it the moment that he took your queen on c3? Well, first of all, my move a3 was incredibly stupid uh because there was really no no upside to it i could have made a move like bishop g3 instead kicking the queen away and then played a3 uh i think it just speaks to the fact that it's really really hard to play for a win on demand and i know i know that i'm usually not in the right state of mind when i when I do, and I usually play significantly worse. And I think that's how you make these sorts of oversights that you that you sort of tense up and you start to think about the result rather than the process. And I mean, I've been around for a long time, so I know these things, but it's still kind of hard to, it's still kind of hard to do. As for the moment um, itself, as I explained um, another time, he flinched a bit when when I played a3, which is usually a tell that you've done something wrong. And then, of course, I spotted the trick um, immediately, and and I thought I was uh, was out of uh, the tournament. In terms of when I thought I'd get chances, I thought when he chopped off my queen. Um, you know, that was such a huge relief. And I thought at that, that moment that the end game was a bit better for me. It took me just a little time, though, to realize that even the end game is pretty much unwinnable, which just speaks to how poor a move A3 was. And then for the next next few moves, I was really just trying to play a bit psychologically um i was seeing that he was a little bit tense a little bit nervous like some of his moves were i thought over cautious so i thought i should try and give him as many many choices as um as as possible and um he he was clearly hesitating, for instance, whether to play a5, which is more or less forced me to play a4. And I very much understand why he wouldn't do it, because it looks like the uh, structure is closed and there is some potential for white to get the knight to, um, to, to b5 and then afterwards start moving on the... On the king side, and you sort of feel that you're just gonna have to to wait. And I think, like move by move, there's it's not realistic that I can get these setups. But I, I think he just didn't want to clarify that situation immediately. And once I got in the break f4, um, e5, I really started to really started to believe. Um, and there, 
after the time control, even though, uh, even though I thought the position was obviously still a draw objectively, I had a pr pretty clear target um, to push the the A pawn. It was hard for him to create real counterplay uh, on the on the king side because um, it was just really slow. So I thought he would have to find a way to to hold rather than to get serious counterplay, and that's very unpleasant psychologically. Um, so I felt from at, on that from that moment on, I felt really calm. I thought as long as he cannot force the draw uh, or get obvious counterplay then i should eventually get winning chances um so you know the rest i guess is um is history yeah magnus uh one thing about today's rapid match we have heard that you had uh, food poisoning you have been suffering the last couple of days but yesterday you shocked the board by playing on the ccc qualifier you have played eight games that kind of, uh, and you scored seven and a half points against incredible players. That was kind of a clear statement for the chess world that, yes, I'm ready to fight. What were your thoughts by playing that qualifier? Uh, well, first of all, apologies to the um, players whom I beat and may have taken some chances away. I, I really just wanted to play a few games to, to warm up. Um, as I've spoken about before, Rapid chess is um, is a mix between classical and blitz. So getting some blitz warm up, I thought, would be good. And I also wanted to see like if my brain actually works. And thought the the answer was yeah, kind of. Because even though I had a good score, um, even though I had a good score, the the games weren't so good. And there were several reasons where why I. Uh, quit when i i did um first of all i could see that well my level was not so was not so good but it, it was okay i'd sort of gotten the answers i wanted i didn't want to exhaust myself and i i i knew as i start as soon as i started to to lose i would get pissed so i i thought yeah um let's uh let's leave it at that with some some good warm-up uh, Magnus, another uh, feature chat question that I'll piggyback off of from Harry Osborne, 72, uh, who's asking about your mentality going into the Speed Chess Championship. And on top of that, you've been playing uh, online tournaments on chess.com regularly from Title Tuesdays uh, to the Bullet Brawls, you know, unfortunately for some of us. Uh, <laughs> just kidding, of course. Uh, could you tell us your favorite regular online event? Is it the SCC? Or is it something else? And these days, what is your preferred time control online? Yeah, I would say the uh, Speed Chess Championship is, yeah, it's by far my my favorite event on, on chess.com. Uh, I really think that is, yeah, it's sort of the, the, the pinnacle of, uh, of uh, Speed Chess really and it's uh the tournament that shows who's who so um i'm uh, excited to be um to be participating that in that again and try and um uh, try and do even better than um than, than last time one question from the chat as well. Magnus, could anything change your mind to play in the World Championship if the format changes from Phantom Lova? I think specifically the games would have to be shorter. If I were to... Let me preface this by saying that I, I'm not intending to put any pressure whatsoever on FIDE or trying to change the format. Um, this is just my my thoughts and my opinion. Uh, the one non-negotiable point for me, um, if I ever were to, to play the World Championship again, is that there would have to be uh, more games and 
shorter time controls. And I, I think specifically two games in a day is um, it's very, very interesting. And then time control could be, for instance, um, uh, for instance, an hour per player and then some some increment at some point. Um, so uh, with the classical time control, I think there is there is just no way that I'm returning to the World Championship. That's unambiguous enough, Magnus. We appreciate your insights. I think it's time for us to uh, let you off for your well-deserved rest. One more massive congratulations on your first World Cup victory. <clears throat> and thank you so much for offering your insights and your thoughts uh, here in the studio. Thank you, Magnus, and congratulations. Yeah, thank you guys so much. You do you do an awesome job. And uh, I've enjoyed listening to you guys a lot on the, the rest days I've gotten, or the tie breaks, rather. So keep up the good work, and uh, um, and the thanks to everybody who's, um, who's watching us as well. Much appreciated.